Welcome to the live stream. Today we're going to go over some government jobs, questions and answers in order to help you get a government job. So the first question that I have here is from Dynamo3059. He asked, how much difference does accepted service versus competitive service really make for being able to move around? So it's going to make a lot of difference because the majority of the jobs are actually in the competitive service. If you accept an accepted service type job, it's gonna make it a little bit more difficult to transfer. So transfer within your agency or maybe into another agency. The competitive service, the way that it works is if you get hired in the competitive service, it takes three years. After those three years, you're granted like a tenure. So you can always compete for those competitive service type jobs. Now, I wouldn't let this discourage you. If you have an opportunity, like let's say a GS-12, job offer from ex accepted service or a GS 11 from competitive, I would take the higher GS grade because you can still apply through those open to the public positions or through other accepted service positions. Another thing is that one of the biggest agencies that have accepted service is the post office. Almost the entire post office is accepted service. Then you have the Department of Justice. They have um, the legal agencies like CIA, FBI, all of those agencies will be accepted service, and that's because they use a different type of hiring process. So accepted service is used to kind of circumvent the OPM rules for hiring. And also a lot of the non-competitive appointments, those will all be accepted services. So don't feel bad about taking an accepted service type position. Okay, so the next one is from Glenn York 9354. Have you ever seen an organization actually utilize the non-competitive hiring authority for a CPS eligible applicant? Okay, so the answer is yes. There are a lot of agencies that use this. If you're talking about CPS in the context of a disabled veteran, 30% disabled veteran, then there are a lot of ways that you can enter into the government. One of them being is if you go to fedshirevets.gov. So if you're a disabled veteran, I recommend pretty much all of them, to first go on to fedshirevets.gov, then click on the agency directory. In there, you will find a point of contact email address. You can email the veteran coordinator your resume, your SF-15, and then also your DD-214. When you do that, a lot of times they can line a position up for you. The job announcement might not even be open to view on USA Jobs, but they can still line you up. You can actually get some of these positions without even interviewing, but um, it only goes up to GS-11. So if you need something higher than GS-11, then you know probably don't do it. But if you're okay coming in GS-9, GS-11, then you definitely need to, to, to look into that. The thing with that, like I just talked about, is you're gonna come in on the accepted service. After two years, it will convert to competitive service. So if you're okay with that, look into doing that. All right, next question. Sasha Lob 4 asks, active duty in September of this year. I have a statement of service and I want to start applying for federal jobs. However, because veteran preference points is for 120 days, do I only apply to jobs open to the public? Okay, if you're about to get out of the military, you have your statement of service. Most of these letters uh, extend out to your, to your separation date, your ETS date. So instead of doing that, what you can do, if your unit's okay with it, move that date to when you actually start terminal leave. There's a three month difference a lot of the times. You have your permissive PDY and you have leave, terminal leave. That's two or three months that you can actually start early to apply for a job if you change that date. So on the statement of service, I believe you need your lieutenant commander, your lieutenant colonel or a commanding officer in the rank of 05. If you can get that individual to sign off and, and S1 is okay with it, I would change the date to reflect when you start terminal leave because you can start working when you hit terminal leave. So look into that. Um, that will help you start applying a little bit early. Okay, next question. Autumn B905 asks, is it rare for an agency to make an offer without interviewing? This is somewhat uncommon. But it does happen, it still happens, even in the DC area. This usually will occur if the GS grade is below 11. So if you're 
GS9, GS7, GS6, a lot of those grades, they will extend a job offer and just completely not even do the interview process. Another time where, another time where agencies can do this is if it's an internal candidate. So if they already know the individual, they're not going to interview them again. A lot of times people, uh, if you work for a federal agency, they will email you open opportunities within that agency. So you'll know, not just your office, but other offices. So if you work for the Department of Health and Human Services, you will get emails, or you probably more than likely will get emails that show you that you can start applying to some of these internal positions. And most of the time they know who you are, they've seen you for the last couple of years, and they'll just give you the job offer. But it does, it's, it does still happen. All right, next question. Rhea Tin asks, what was your first government job? Did you start off in city, state, or federal? Do you host webinars or visit college campuses? Okay, my first government job was with the Veteran Affairs. Now, I didn't have any other like local level government. I wasn't in the state or the city, but I was in the, in the military. So that did give me an advantage. I was in the military and then I accepted a position with the Veteran Affairs. Now, while I was doing this, I actually worked as an instructor at Elizabeth City State University, but I've never visited a university for the sole purposes of talking about government jobs. I've never participated or given a webinar before. I would be open to that, but I, I've never had that opportunity presented to me. I never aggressively pursued anything like that. So, uh, and then once I got into the government, I helped a couple of friends of friends. They didn't have any veteran status actually get in into the government. So, all right, let's go to the next one. Absolutely, Rasha. Congrats on the referrals, by the way. Ask, should we upload a PDF or a Word document for your resume? So you really should upload the Microsoft Word document, and this is because it's searchable. So when you upload your resume, you have an option to click. There's a box that says, do you want to make this searchable? And if you do that, and it's a Word document, then HR offices and other agencies, they can search to find critical skills that are needed in order to extend you an interview. This happens probably more than people think. If you have those valuable critical skills, like say you're an IT professional that has certain coding language perhaps, or if you're an engineer, lawyer, some of these skills that the government desperately is trying to find, they will, they'll reach you if you let them. If you click, uh, if you click make my resume searchable, they'll actually reach out to you. So uh, Microsoft Word. Hey, with that, when you're uploading your resume, you have an option, upload your resume or use the resume builder. If you do not feel comfortable building your own resume, then you probably should use the resume builder because every field in there that they list, they pretty much make it foolproof to make sure you have all the required information. Now, for me, I don't prefer it. I don't prefer using the resume builder because I feel when you create your own document, you can do certain things to it, talking about format and style, to make it more appealing, to make it more eye-popping, right? You have to consider the human, the human resource specialist is like reviewing all of these resumes. And a lot of them are in the same format. And if you look at the resume builder format, it's not, it's not eye-pleasing. It, uh, it kind of strains the eyes. The font's really small. So I would prefer to use uh, a custom resume. But uh, you have to understand also there are federal agencies out there that will not take your, your custom PDF or, docu or your Word document resume, like the Coast Guard. And there's other agencies that require, they mandate that you use the resume builder. So that's something to keep in mind also. It says the max, another question, the max resume allowed at once is six. Can we delete or replace them after the job application ends? Yes. Once you uploaded your resume and it's attached to that application package, that's going to human resources. What you do on USA Jobs, you can delete it. You can replace it. It's still going to be attached to that application, so don't worry about that. Do we need to add supervisor's info? Well, <laughs> the correct answer is this is optional. Your supervisor's info and the salary, they're optional. But the way that I look at it, I feel like it's uh, providing maximum transparency if you go ahead and list it. So I recommend everyone list their supervisor's name and your salary. And another thing, people are a little self-conscious if they have a lower salary. So let's say you earned $70,000 last year and you're trying to get a position that pays the salary is like 120,000, so it's like a GS-12. 
or GS-13, they don't want to list their salary because there's a huge disparity. <laughs> there's a huge um, there's a huge gap into what they used to make and what they're trying to make. That is not being considered. So th don't feel bad if there's like a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar gap between what you're making now and what you're trying to get in the federal government. I would still list your salary. You know, be as transparent as possible. What is the maximum length on your resume? This is going to depend on the agency, and not just the agency, the office also. Look through the job announcement, and it'll say in there, we will not review any resume over five pages. And then you know, like, okay, I need to make sure that my resume doesn't go over. So I find to be on the safe side, you should have about, I would aim for six, if you have 10 years of experience, six to eight pages, something like that. If you have less, that's fine. People get hired on, on two or three page resumes. I mean, I, there's a lot of talk and your resume has to be 10 pages or eight pages. It's gonna vary a lot. Look at the job announcement, make sure there's not a page of the limit. But if you're doing a base resume, five, six, seven pages, you should be fine. The sample, right? okay, writing samples. Uh, for sample writing, what is it supposed to be? Okay, I actually, <laughs> before the pandemic, I had an interview at a government job where they made you do the writing sample in the office. So you had to come to the office, you would do the interview, and then they put you in this room and they wanted you to provide a writing sample. I think for mine, it was an email. So they give you a scenario, like this is the scenario, I want you to write an email informing the supervisor on this situation. And they gave me 30 minutes, so I had to type it out. That's not how it is so much anymore. Uh, with the writing samples, once again, look at the job announcement. Uh, sometimes it'll tell you, hey, we wanna see a memo example. Type up a memo and let us see what that looks like. If it doesn't tell you, I would, uh, I would do a memo or I would do a policy letter, type one up, and just submit it with your with your application. You should be fine. Um, cover letter, is a cover letter mandatory? Not unless the job announcement asks for it. There's conflicting views on this as well. Some people feel like it's going above and beyond and showing that you're extremely interested and proactive by submitting a cover letter. Where I stand on this is that the human resource specialist has so much papers to read, resumes to read. So they're going through 20, 30, 40, 50 resumes and they're looking at it, each one six, seven, eight pages. So I don't think there is um, a benefit. There is not normally a benefit by adding more paperwork. Uh, they'll look at it, but I do not think it's going to make the decision the majority of the time. So I wouldn't, I really wouldn't do it unless, like I said, the job announcement requires it. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, looks like we got some people in here. Hey, if anyone's in the D.C. area, by chance, can you go ahead and type me and let me know if you're in the D.C. area? Okay. Next question. L. Nicole, 2206. What are the chances of getting a federal job? GS 11 and up if you're not a veteran. No prior federal experience and no preferences. Okay. I would say your chances are about 50-50. <laughs> 50% of the jobs, are, uh, as of yesterday, 50% of the jobs, they were open to the public. So you had 15,000 jobs yesterday open to the public. So you could apply for them. No matter, no matter what your status or what your hiring path is, you can apply to them. The others, uh, there was a total of 30 or 31,000 total jobs yesterday. The others, they have a hiring path attached to them. So as long as you have a strong resume, I think that you can still get in. Um, and this reminds me, there was a guy recently... He came into the government in the D.C. area. He came into the veteran affairs not too long ago. He worked in the private sector 15 years. And he entered the VA, I want to say it as a GS-12. And two years later, he was a, G or he was a GS-12 or GS-13, one of the two. But he came from banking. And he was like a retail bank manager. So he did that. When he came in, he wasn't even in finance. He was not in the 0500 series. He actually, I think he was a 0341. So this happens every day. People come in just using their private sector experience. What it's going to come down to is your resume. And you're not going to have the same edge as somebody who has a hiring path. Like a recent student graduate, they're going to have a lot less competition. So the competition is going to be tough out there. But yeah, definitely you can do it. Okay. Next question. Leslie... Chiz Home 8096. What are the agencies you've heard the best things about? Also, 
what are some agencies that people tend not to care for? Okay. The best federal agency that comes to the forefront of my mind is USPTO, which is the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and it's in Alexander, Virginia. I cannot stop hearing amazing things coming out of that agency. Uh, great, everything that you can imagine. Great end of year bonuses, performance bonuses, amazing. Work-life balance, amazing. So <laughs> that's that would be number one, in, in my opinion, from my experience. Also, NASA is great. Um, a lot of people are happy with Health and Human Services. So as far as the ones that are not uh, not cared for, that's the language you use, not care for, people don't care for them. <laughs> I would say um, Department of Homeland Security. You know, there's a lot of controversy with some of the some of the stuff that goes on there. Department of Defense, you know, with, with that, I would say if you're in the military or you know anybody in the military, there's a certain culture in a lot of military units. What happens when military leaders end up transitioning out, they go to DOD because it's familiar to them. They, they work side by side with a lot of DOD civilians. They speak the same language, the acronyms. So a lot of that culture can kind of bleed into the DOD. And the same with DHS. DHS is huge. There's immigration. There's all kinds. There's Border Patrol. There's all kinds of sub-agencies within DHS. And um, a lot of the same thing, right? So... You know, if you if you love the military culture, then you might you might like it. But you know, a lot of people they have different they have a different opinion than that. Um, okay, if a candidate is open to relocation for a job, should they include that information anywhere in particular when no uh, when applying? So no, if you're open to relocate, you do not need to include anything extra when you're applying for a job announcement. Human resource. For the most part, they assume that you're either in the area or you're willing to move to the area. So they're going to extend an interview and they're going to extend a job offer. And you're going to have to tell them, you know, whether you declined it or not because you can't move or you need relocation assistance. With the relocation assistance, a lot of that information should be in the, in the actual job announcement. All right, let's go to the next one. Not a specific question. Uh, details on SL roles and deeper dive into SES. So SL is senior leadership. SES is executive. There's three services in the federal government. You have your senior executive service, your competitive service, and your accepted service. So the reason why I don't really talk about SES that much is because it's less it's less than one percent of the government. So I don't think um, I don't think a lot of people are interested. But if you're interested, let me know. If you're really interested in SES that's where you're really topping out on the pay chart. You're hitting 250, 260,000, 260,000 a year. Very selective. Uh, there's a lot of programs in place that kind of guide a person through. If you are a GS-14 or a GS-15, there are six to eight month programs that will kind of take you through the process to help you be competitive for an SES job. But you do not need to have prior federal government experience a lot of people that were executives at private companies, they can still become SESs. No one's really asked me much about SESs, so I haven't talked about it. So Leslie Chisholm, thank you for bringing that up. And I will consider doing a video if there's greater interest in that. Uh, okay. Another question. If you have experience in one career path outside of the government, but you're wanting to make a change to something different, is it wise to make that change outside of the government? and then later try to obtain a federal job in the new career, you don't have to. Uh, you don't really have to do that at all. So you know, follow on question, is it possible to make a career switch once you're in a fed, fed job? Yes, absolutely, what does it look like? Okay, so if you're working a job, let's say that you're working human resources, you can pivot provided that you have the experience. So if you have five, uh, three, three or five years in the, in the government position, say you're human resources, but before that, you have five years, you were in the military and you did data analytics and you want to go back to that. You can do the shift. Human resource is not, is not supposed to look at your previous job series and just make assumptions. That's the one thing they don't do. They don't make assumptions. So they're going to, they're going to evaluate your resume on the merit of your experience. Now, also, you could be learning different skills in your current position. So you could be in the 2210 job series, right? So you could be doing computers. Say you're a software developer. You're doing software development and you get burnt out with it and that's not what you really wanted to do. 
while you're a software developer, you can pick up other skills from the job. Maybe you volunteer, do a detail, something like that. You gain those skills. With those skills, you can pivot. Now, a lot of times when you're pivoting, depending on what job series you're looking at, you can be taking a step back, right? And most people don't want to do that. One of the craziest things I've, I've heard recently, it just came to my mind, uh, a lot of people are willing to take a step back for HR, for human resources. I don't know why. They're at the GS11, GS12, uh, a couple of GS12s come to mind, and they're, they're willing to go to GS9 again just because they want to do human resources. Um, most people I talk to, my general view is human resources is not that desirable. I don't know why people are attracted to that field. But to answer your question, you do not need to leave the government to work in a different job in order to get in at a different series. You can make a career shift at any time, provided you have the experience. If you don't, try to start attaining it and then make the pivot when you're ready. Okay. 077 Junior A Amo, Junior Amo, ask more information on Schedule A. Uh, more information on Schedule A. Okay, so Schedule A, if you don't know, is um, it's a disability, right? So if you ha if you're disabled, either intellectually, physical, or um, psychiat psychiatrically, can't say the word right now. If you're disabled in one of those areas, you can go to your doctor, take a sample letter. There's a lot of sample letters on the internet. If you want to if you want to schedule a sample a sample letter, send me an email and I'll I'll, I'll send you one. Take that letter, have your doctor sign off on it. You do not have to be specific on what type of disability that you have, but you do need that letter signed. Once it's signed, you can compete for this new hiring path called Schedule A. And basically, you'll have about 3,000 more jobs that you're able to apply for. If you, if you have no other hiring path but Schedule A, you'll have 3,000 more jobs that you're able to apply for. Not only that, it's a non-competitive appointment, so you don't have to go through the competitive process, which means you will be on the accepted service until it converts. It can convert after 12, 24 months. You can convert to competitive service. The interesting thing about Schedule A, you have coordinators uh, in, in the majority of federal agencies. There's a website. You go on there. You can filter through whatever agency you're interested in, and you can reach out to these coordinators and with your resume and with your Schedule A letter and ask them, are there any additional opportunities in this job series that you could be that you could apply for? The job might not even be posted, and you could still end up getting an interview. Or another way to do it is to apply for a job announcement, and then at the very at the very bottom of the job announcement, there's a point of contact. Email that individual and let them know you just applied and you have Schedule A. So that's another way. Now, federal agencies do not have to honor it. They do not have to do it, but a lot of them do it. So you still have to be qualified, obviously. Um, so maybe I'll do another video on Schedule A. I don't think I've done one. So, um, okay. Question on probation. Here's the deal with probation. A lot of people, when they first get into the government, they're overly worried about probation. <sighs> Excuse me. They're overly concerned about probation. The vast majority of people make it through their 12-month probation. Some people have 24 months. They make it through the 24 months. Um, there was an agency I was at, and there was a new hire. This person was showing up late, like multiple times, and there was talk like, there was talk saying, uh, I can't believe she's showing up late because she's already on probation. She needs to be careful. Hey, nothing happened to her. Nothing usually happens. And I'm not saying that you can just start showing up late and acting a fool. You want to be professional and do the best that you can, but I wouldn't. I would not let it stress you out too much. I would not lose sleep over it. Uh, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're not going to have too many issues. Okay, I've been largely focused on these questions that were submitted previously. I'm going to go ahead and look at the chat. So it might take me a while. All right. All right. Good morning. Once you become a federal employee, is it more difficult to apply to jobs that are open to public? Is it more difficult? Will the agency prefer to hire? No, not necessarily. No, 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 no. It's not more difficult. If anything, once you become a federal employee, um, and if you're in the competitive service for three years, it's going to be easier. It's going, it's going to be, a, especially whatever agency you're at, now you're open to internal. So if I, 
if you were a federal government employee, the first thing I would say, if you're looking for a, a, um, a higher GS grade, I would look at internal opportunities. So go to USA Jobs, pick your agency, hit internal hire, and look through there. Uh, but it should not be more difficult. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, I give you credits. You're very welcome, Russia. Oh, we have some people in D.C. That's great. There's so many opportunities in this area, if you're willing. Not just with federal government, but also contracting. But they cannot discriminate, so they will take your application. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you'll never know what is inside the head of a hiring manager or what is inside the head of a human resource specialist. So, I mean... The best that you can do is just, you know, strengthen that resume, keep applying, try to stay optimi optimistic. But yeah, you know, sometimes it's not going to work out for you. Sometimes they have someone else in mind. Wow, 4,000. Ellen Nicole, one of the jobs I applied to had over 4,000 applicants. I'm willing to wager that was probably a remote work position. 100% remote work positions. A lot, here recently, they've been getting thousands of applicants. It is crazy. The remote jobs will have more applicants. Yes, yes. I retired in 2023, took a course for two months through the VA, was paid through the VA. How do I capture that experience in a federal resume? I retired and I took a course two months. Okay. So, um, selective job training. You should have an area in your resume towards the end. If you don't, you can put in additional information. If you have a course like that, that's relevant to the specialized experience, it's relevant to the job, I would capture that under your training. And then you can be as detailed as you'd like about it so that whoever's reading it understands how it's relevant. So you can put it there. Okay. Oh, I got a super chat, wow. Thank you, Autumn. Very much appreciated. Thank you for your videos and this live. Very, I'm, I'm glad it was helpful, I'm glad you found it helpful. Thank you very much. DOD is horrible. <laughs> yeah, that's not the first time I've heard that. I mean, um, a lot of times where you end up in your agency, it's going to depend on your supervisor or whatever executive is in charge of your office. But I, I have heard some challenges coming from the DOD area. Yeah, everything is subjective. How can I connect with consulting and coaching? Naznin. If you look at the description of this video, and pretty much all of my videos, there are links there if you're interested in um, a phone call, one-on-one -on -one consultation, things like that. There's also some templates there. I know uh, some people are looking for different type of templates. You can find those in the description as well. There's also a course that um, I go ahead and I teach you uh, through video content and one-on-one -on -one interaction through email. I kind of teach you some ways that you can better craft your resume to get the attention from human resources so you can get referred and interviewed. All those links are in the description below. Thank you for asking about that. HR is evil. Sometimes. Most of the times. <laughs> uh, that was a great idea. Okay, just reading through the last of these comments and then we'll wrap it up. If you have any other questions, go ahead and feel free to drop them in here before we wrap this up. I really appreciate everyone being here. What? I got the USA. I got the email that referred me to the hiring manager. Okay, I got selected by the supervisor. CPAC tells me I'm ineligible. What? That doesn't sound right. So you were selected by the hiring manager, referred to, and you were selected. If you were selected, man, that doesn't sound right at all. I would uh, reach back out to the hiring manager and let them know exactly what happened. There are so many things that will that would prevent this from occurring, right? So you should have never, if, if the job announcement was only for disabled veterans, they should have never referred you. They should have never interviewed you. They should have never selected you. So for you to go through all these steps and then at the very end, when the job offer is about to be extended, they realize you don't qualify, that doesn't sound right to me. I would definitely contact the hiring manager and probably also the, the human resource specialist. This place employee, this place employee 
is uh, so say if you have an agency that goes through a rift, a reduction in force um, in Nebraska. So because they had to reduce their size, you will have employees. They don't want to call them fired or terminated or laid off, but basically they're displaced because there's no, no longer a need for them in that area. And that grants them preference when they're looking for a different for another job. Oh, thanks, Rasha. Thanks for this for the for the super thanks. Appreciate that. Um, um, I'm a college student seeking a government internship. I keep getting rejected for lack of experience. Wow, that's a, that's ironic. <laughs> You're on an internship. Um, when you're applying, the, the best, the first thing that comes to my mind, if you're getting rejected for lack of experience, you need to put on there uh, the experience that you have from, from university, from your school. Right? So if you're trying to get an internship, there are things that you have done probably throughout school, whether it's volunteering or working a job on the side or whatever you've done. Talk to your professor about that. One of your professors at the university should be able to guide you. You know, these professors... They have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of students that come in and out, and a lot of them end up getting these internships. So they should be like a template or a format or something that they can share with you to help improve your chances. But whatever whatever application or packet you're sending, it's not, it's not sufficient. So it needs to be relooked, it needs to be reworked, but I'm sure you can do it. You can at least compete for it. I, would, I wouldn't let that dissuade you. I would keep competing. What is the meaning of the rating? What, what is the percentage for? I'm not sure what context that is, but a lot of times... Um, when we talk about rating, we talk about disability rating. So that means 30% dis uh, disabled for, for veterans. That grants them additional points and preference. Good morning. I got the job offer two weeks ago. Congratulations, SMMWM. Congratulations on the job offer. When do I start negotiating steps? I tell you what, as soon as you get the tentative job offer, as soon as that hits your inbox, that's when you do it. You start negotiating your steps. And uh, your start date. Your start date, okay, so you can negotiate your step level now. When it comes to your start date, um, they're going to have to wait until all the background information starts to come in. Once the background information comes in, then you can, uh, they'll propose a start date to you, and then you can go back and forth. So they'll say, like, if it's, what is it, February? They'll say, hey, March 15th, we want you to start. And then you can counter and say, well, I actually would like to start at the end of March because I have a vacation planned. And, you know, most of the time they're very flexible. They'll work with you. Rasha gave you a stupid... Yes, thank you, Rasha, for the super sticker. I appreciate that. Just reading through the last of these among great videos. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. I followed your advice and got hired to WGOA. Great. Goodness, sir, sir. Another job offer. That's outstanding, Jose. Congratulations on the job offer. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's a high compliment. Nice. Can I negotiate my step level? Yes, you absolutely can do that. Um, for step level... I have a video on that, but real quick for step level of negotiation, you basically have to show how you're superiorly qualified. So there's a memo that you have to submit to HR show, demonstrating why you're superiorly qualified, and you can use that to get a higher uh, step level. All, a lot of people also use their last pay stub. So you can say, at my previous position, this is how much I was earning. So in order to not take a pay cut, I would have to come in at... GS 11 step four, for example. You can use that to negotiate also. So I would do both. If you're with local or state government, will it improve your chances to get in with the feds? Um, I, don't, I don't think it would improve. It would not give you additional preference, if that's the question, but it does count as experience. The most important thing when it comes to this type of question, it depends on how relevant is your experience. So you can work at the state and the city level and the county level. You can work there 10 years, but when you're applying to a federal job, if that experience is not relevant to the position, then you're not gonna be referred. So that's the best way I can answer that. Please hit the like button. Thank you, yeah, definitely. Please hit the like button. You know, I'm really surprised we have over 20 people here. I thought I was gonna be talking to myself. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 
Uh, I got an email. Make sure I say that was selected. They asked my pay stubs. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that mean? Um, yeah, so the reason they probably asked for your pay stubs is if they had to do like a, a step, if they had to uh, adjust their step, which is great for them for being proactive and trying to pay you, you know, close to what you were making. Does that mean I will receive the offer? So typically speaking, you're going to get, you will have two offers. You will have the tentative offer and then you'll have the final offer. But after the tentative offer, you have to, uh, you have to fill out all the documents, do the background check. A lot of times there's a credit check. You have to go and get your picture taken, your fingerprints. And it's a, it's a bit of a process. And there's a security team assigned to your, your case. So depending on how backed up that security team is, I mean, it could take weeks, it could take up to a month. So expect a tentative offer. And then once all the paperwork is completed and you're deemed qualified and fit, then they will go ahead and extend the final job offer. Okay. I, went from, I went from state for two years right in the middle. Oh, so that's awesome. Uh, seven? Seven? seven. Uh, no, providing a pay stub is not mandatory. All right, thank you for the response. I wish you the best. Three months. Okay, great. I wonder if there are any questions. Good point, Marjorie. Good point. What if, you, what if you got a new job, and by the time you get an interview, your resume is updated? Listen, um, <laughs> if, they're extending you, if they are extending you the interview, then there's no need to, to change your resume, or there's no need to give HR the new version of your resume. Any type of changes that have occurred from when you applied to when you have an interview, you can voice those changes during the interview. I mean, we're only talking about a few months, I suppose. I would only voice them if the experience is relevant. So if you have a new job, but the experience that you've been receiving for the last two or three months, it's not relevant to the position that you're interviewing for, I wouldn't even mention it unless they ask you. So, all right, let's see. Any other questions? I'll give about 30 seconds or so to see if there are any more questions. Hey, I was also thinking about, there's a lot of people that are interested in 0300, a lot of people interested in 2210 those two job series. So what I was thinking about is creating um, a resume, creating a resume for the 0300 series and just packing it full of uh, keywords, a lot of the language that you'll see on the majority of job announcements. Doing that and like kind of creating a template for that and uh, combining it, like maybe like a 0343 and a 0301 and like putting them together and then putting the keywords and kind of making it like a bundle, like a pack so that if someone uh, wants to see how a resume looks like that actually went through the went through the federal hiring process. If they want to see how that looks like, then they could they could uh, download that. I was thinking about doing that. It'll probably take me a couple of weeks though. If there's any interest in that, let me know. Um, okay. What else do we have? I believe we have the That's right. Yes. Uh, tentative. Yes. Right after the tentative job offers, when you can start. No more questions. Do more of these. All right, I'll, I'll try. We'll try to make that happen. Okay, great. Hey, I uh, really appreciate everyone for coming. Um, please like, share, subscribe. Thank you all for watching. Have a great Sunday. Have a great rest of your weekend. And hopefully I'll see you guys soon. Bye.